All right, so welcome everybody. This is not where we left off. Remember we left off in that gross picture of the octopi eating the whale carcass. It's very gross. So then we're here. There we go. Okay, that's where we're. Okay, so, and then let's see, Francis came in. Let me get Francis. Okay, so um, we're continuing along with ocean sediments. I got my ocean sediments thing out here. Yeah, here we go. And we're actually moving along with different kinds. So we talked about sediment sizes, right? So we did all the sediment sizes. And then we, after that, we talked about the second way of classifying sediments. So we can classify sediments by, first of all, well, what's the first way we classify sediments? So first, the first way we can classify sediments. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, by grain size, right? So what are the different kinds of grain sizes we can have? What's up? Fine. Yeah, fine. Like, what are some specific examples of fine? Clay and silt. Yeah, clay and silt, right? So you remember seeing that in the clay and silt. And then uh, you could have, what, what are some other things? Specific names of the sediment, grain size. What's that? Are you saying, like, what types? Yeah, the sediment, like, different kinds of sediment grain sizes, right? So. Cobble. Yeah. Oh, cobble, sure. So I didn't, I didn't quite hear you. Cobble, yeah. So cobbles. And then, you know, there's things, of course, things like sand and gravel and there's all sorts of things. Now, and the very, very smallest kind is clay, right? Clay and silt. Okay, so anyway, where do we normally find, let's see, I got, I'm getting three marked down here. Okay. So where do we normally find, um, where do we normally find things like clay and silt? Do we find that on the beach or do we find that kind of in the deeper ocean. Deeper ocean. Deeper ocean, okay. So, and then why is it why is it that we find it in the deeper ocean and not so much like right on the beach? Like why don't we find clay right on the, like clay? Like why don't we go to the beach and we just sink right into the mud? It needs low energy to. Yeah, it needs the low energy, right? So it needs low energy. Okay, so that's by grain size. Now remember we also classify sediment according to the sediment, kind of what it's made of or what its source is, okay? So, um, what are the two different types we've talked about so far? Yeah, terrigenous. That's right. It's a weird word, huh? Biogenous. Yeah, and biogenous. Yeah. Biogenous and terrigenous. Okay. So, biogenous and terrigenous. Terrigenous comes from the land, land right? And biogenous comes from yeah, internally from right from the from the life that's in the ocean. So you all remember all that stuff? Okay, so now we're going to talk about some kind of, all right, most of the sediment in the ocean is either terrigenous or biogenous. We're going to talk about some other sources that are a little bit weird, um, and, and then we're going to move on to, to some other stuff. But anyway, so you can all see this. This is gross. Um, I also want to talk about hydrogenous sediment. So do you all remember how I passed around that weird manganese nodule? You all remember that? I, I did that in this class, right? I passed around that manganese nodule. That doesn't ring a bell? I'll get it out again. I thought I did this. find on the bottom of the ocean that are like sediment. You can pass these around and kind of look at them. They are very weird. And it's actually, the ocean floor is filled with these things. Does those, do those look familiar? Yeah. They're called manganese nodules. They're filled with all these rare elements. Actually, people are trying to figure out ways of mining them. So if you cut open a manganese nodule, that's what it looks like on the inside. And really what these things are is they are these clumps of precipitated, precipitated minerals. So they're these like clumps of precipitated mineral. 
So hydrogenous sediments, hydro, you know, means water, right? Genus means where does it kind of, the genesis, you know, where it comes from, the origin of it. So hydrogenous means water generated. So these are things that have precipitated from the water, okay? So uh, things that have precipitated from the water. And so some of these things are like, well, we talked about black smokers, right? So there's all the minerals that are precipitating out of the, that you know, composed the smoke of the black smoker. All that stuff is precipitating mineral grains. There's manganese nodules too. And the manganese nodules are made out of this very, very, very slowly precipitated mineral, mineral material. And like I said, they can tear up, contain a lot of uh, kind of like rare earth minerals and, and uh, important, important uh, uh, elements. That, so I, like I said, people have been trying to figure out ways of mining these things off the bottom of the seafloor. So. so chemical reactions that precipitate uh, in the water cr creates these, uh, creates these uh, hydrogenous sediments. Okay? So they form from precipitation. So does that all make sense? That makes sense. You all understand what hydrogenous sediments are. So these are kind of of less importance compared to terrigenous and biogenous. You'll see that the vast majority of sediment on the seafloor is terrigenous and biogenous. Okay. So these are just kind of extra things that you should be aware of. So um, has anyone ever seen like a precipitation reaction? I'm sure Colton has because I know that I know that. Uh, yeah, in chemistry, right? So, I know, and also Mr. Kramer loves to do those. Um, yeah. Did he do the one for you? Did he do those reactions for you in like physical geology or? or oh, you didn't take it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I should actually bring this stuff in. Maybe next class, if I can remember, I'll bring it in. But anyway, here are just some videos of precipitation reactions. So you can mix totally two totally clear fluids that just contain some dissolved ions and they'll react and they'll precipitate out a solid, right? So here's some examples of that. Nitrate with um, sodium chloride to give you the, the solid that you see is the silver chloride. <laughs> What you see there is that gold stuff is silver, silver sulfide. Barium sulfate. See, it makes something that almost looks like smoke, kind of like the black smokers, right? So it's precipitating out all these solids when the two liquids react. Ooh, that one's neat. Silver chromate. Oh, chromate is highly poisonous to a person. But it makes very beautiful colors. That's kind of gross. I don't really like that one. I don't know what they're going for in that. Anyway. So anyway, you know what precipitation is now, right? There's some mag manganese. Isn't that weird? Can you all see that picture? That's all the manganese nodules that are on the seafloor in some places. It looks like it's covered with a bunch of like little golf balls or something. So very valuable though. Very valuable golf balls. Now another thing, this is another weird thing. This is another kind of hydrogenous sediment. You can consider it a sediment. So do you see can you see the stuff that kind of looks like ice right there? So it's not really ice, it's frozen methane. It's frozen methane. So if you put, you know methane's, um, you know what methane is, right? Methane's a natural gas. So if you put methane under high enough pressure, it'll become a solid, right? So you can, you can just, just like you can make methane, you put it under enough pressure, you can make it a liquid, right? You've probably heard of like liquid petrol or like liquid natural gas and things like that. So you can put it under enough pressure, it becomes a solid, so you can have ice. So you have methane ices. So it's really weird. 
So, so in places where there's a lot of biologic activity, you know how, you know how a lot of bacteria can release. Did you know that a lot of bacteria can release methane? Can release. Um, has anyone ever heard of like swamp gas or stuff, something like that? You ever heard of, hear of swamp gas? And sometimes it can catch on fire. And it can, okay, maybe you have no idea what I'm talking about, but. It's a thing, okay, it's a thing. Maybe I need to add a video of swamp gas catching on fire, but it is a thing. But anyway, this is actually solidified methane. So I'll show you. This is really weird stuff. And you can actually take this stuff and get it off of the seafloor and light it on fire, because it's methane, right? So this is just some pictures of that. Just uh, pay attention to this because this guy is going to actually answer 3A, okay, in just a little bit. So be on the lookout for that. Okay, so just to clarify that, in case you didn't catch it, the thing is, is that if temperatures in the ocean were to go up a little bit, it could destabilize some of the ices that are holding all this methane. So if those ices destabilize, they collapse, they release the methane, it could lead to this catastrophic release of methane gas. And uh, some people have actually, some scientists have actually proposed or hypothesized this could be a source of different mass extinctions over Earth's history. Um, things, things like this, like catastrophic release of methane gas from the bottom of the ocean. Um, it's not proven absolutely true or false, just a hypothesis. But uh, that's why some people are concerned about it. Whether that's a valid concern or not, I'm not. I'm not really sure, but uh, it is something that scientists are. Some scientists are concerned about. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah, and that's another thing. A lot of bacteria, you know that there's a lot of energy in methane, right? I mean, we burn methane, right? So there's a lot of other kinds of bacteria. There's some bacteria that produce methane. There are other kinds of bacteria that actually eat the methane. So they derive, they eat it just like a sugar, just like you know, we eat sugar and glucose, carbohydrates, okay? They, they process methane, they metabolize methane. So does that make sense? So that's what he's explaining there is that the methane release could just get eaten all up very quickly by methane eating bacteria in the ocean. Do you like the burning ice? All right, so that's um, a little part on hydrogenous sediments. Now, there's another source of sediment that is just kind of like very rare, but I wanted you to kind of be aware of it, and that's what's called cosmogenous sediment. Cosmogenous meaning from outer space, right? So, so this is sediment that comes from outer space. Because you know that, uh, well, maybe you do know or maybe you don't know, but you might know that a lot of material still hit, hits the Earth, right? Mm -hmm. Has anyone ever seen a shooting star? Okay, so you know what a shooting star is, right? It's a little meteorite that's coming, or I should say, meteoroid that's coming to Earth's atmosphere, and it, most of them burn up. The vast majority of them burn up, but some of them make it through Earth's atmosphere. But in any case, a lot of them explode in the middle of the in the middle of the atmosphere, and they release a lot of dust, right? And that that dust scatters over over the oceans in many cases. When that stuff blows up. So, you know, these things are going very fast. A lot of them are going like close to maybe something like 6,000 miles per hour. Okay, so they're going very, very fast. When they run into our atmosphere, right, even though it just seems like a gas, right, it's, well, I mean, it is a gas, but when it runs into our atmosphere, it might as well be hitting concrete, right, because it, it suddenly experiences a lot more friction than it does in outer space. So it hits, it hits our atmosphere, and like I said, it might as well just be hitting concrete. It's, it's going so fast. So it blows up, it actually has enough kinetic energy, by the way, to totally vaporize and melt the material. So it melts the meteorite, and it forms these little drop, you all see these little circles it's trying to show you? Those are little droplets of molten rock, right, from the meteorite, that have turned into just kind of fine spherical dust. It's like little molten raindrops of rock. Those things are called tektites. So tektites can be very big, like this one, Right, you can obviously there are things you can hold in your hand, or tektites can be microscopic and they look like that. And it's a really good indicator when you're looking through very carefully. You get a microscope like that out, and you're looking at the sediments through maybe you do a drill core or something like that. And you're looking at the sediments. You can actually detect these little micro tektites. It's a good indication that there was a major asteroid strike some point in Earth's history. Right? Do y'all do y'all follow that? So. So these, these things are called tektites. They're little spheres of, spheres of glass from the meteorite that exploded in the atmosphere, okay? So did I answer number four? What's the name of the spherical glass beads? So that's tektites or micro-tektites if they're microscopic uh, that compose com cosmogenous sediments. All right, now um, number five, I asked about neritic and pelagic sediments. And I actually already talked about this. So I talked about it last time. So do you all remember neritic and pelagic and what that means? No? Nobody recalls? No? Oh, you remember? What, why don't you say it out loud for everyone to hear? Veritic is sediment found near the surface yeah. of the water. Yeah. And the other one is deep ocean. Deep ocean, right? Okay, so neritic. So now we're kind of moving away from hydrogenous and cosmogenous sediments, and we're going to neritic, pelagic. So neritic sediments are sediments that form near the coastline, okay? So very, very close to the coast. Pelagic are ones that form into the deep ocean, okay? Oh, look, here's more pictures of tektites. They're kind of cool. They look like glass beads, right? It looks like almost like you would, you would probably if you found that, you would guess somebody made that, right?
types of motion segments. What is this one? Oh, that's just, this is just kind of a, kind of a, a summary slide of all the different types we talked about, right? So terrigenous, biogenous, hydrogenous, and cosmogenous. Yeah. So there's all the different sources of sediment categorized by the source or what it's made out of, okay? All right, um, also here is a map of distribution of neuritic and pelagic sediment. Neuritic and pelagic, okay? So obviously the neuritic sediment, right, is along the coastline. So if you take a look at this map, look at the neuritic sediment, okay? That's near the coast, okay? What, what is that mostly composed of? What, what's the color that's mostly surrounding the coastline? That tan color, right? Can you all read that with that tan color? It's kind of small, isn't it? Can you read that what the tan color represents? Yeah, li 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 well, they call it lithogenous, but lithogenous means, lith means rock, so it's the same as ter terrigenous, okay? It's just another word for terrigenous. So what this map is showing you all is that terrigenous sediments form along the coastline. Does that make sense? Okay, and that should be kind of, in a way, kind of, intuitive or obvious, right? You would expect terrigenous sediments to be close to the coastline. So the point is here, most neuritic sediments, that is the sediments that are close to the coast, are terrigenous, okay? Now in some cases that's not true. You can see that there are some places, eh, well I don't know, is there any case really? You can see where some of these biogenous sediments come close, but they don't quite touch the land. So it looks like in, in almost every case, terrigenous sediment composes the neuritic sediment, right? So neuritic sediment, terrigenous sediment, okay, they're, they're not necessarily one and the same, but there's a strong similarity there. Okay, now when you look at the deep ocean, what is composing the sediment in a deep ocean? Yeah, so that you see a lot of that yellow color, okay? The yellow color is called abyssal clay, abyssal clay. Does anybody know what that word, the abyss, means? What is bottomless that? What's that? Bottomless pit. Yeah, well, like a bottomless pit, so he's deep, right? So these are like the deep ocean, okay? Abyssal clays are like the deep ocean clay. So these are actually things that get blown off of the set, you know, get blown off the continents. It's like the wind-blown clay settles over the, the ocean, okay? So here you can see maps where wind-blown clays are dominant. What does the blue color represent? Can you, can you see that? That's a weird word. You might not be able to pronounce it. It's calcareous, calcareous. Calcareous ooze. What is calcareous ooze? Calcareous ooze is the ooze that is it's biogenous ooze, right? It's generated from all that planktonic light. Okay, now think back to the last lecture. What were the two things that could compose the planktonic shells? Do you remember we talked about like the different kinds of plankton? Do you remember that? I talked about them. Okay, think back to the last lecture. So do you remember some of the different kinds of plankton we talked about? Diatoms. Yeah, diatoms. Dino, do you remember dinoflagellates, okay. foraminifera, et cetera, et cetera? Do you remember what those things were made out of? Like what their shells were made out of, actually? Diatoms. That's right. Diatoms were made of silica. Carbon. And what's that? And the other one's made of carbonate, with calcium carbonate. Okay. So the calcareous ooze, that's biogenous sediment that's made out of calcium carbonate. Okay. The green color is siliceous ooze, and that's the stuff that's made out of the silica. So you can see the green represents where diatoms, the silica-bearing diatoms, are dominant, and the blue represents areas where those things like coccolithophores or um, foraminifera are dominant. Okay, they're the calcite calcium-bearing ones. Okay. So just a reminder, what is that stuff What are those shells made out of? They're either made out of calcium carbonate or they're made out of silica. Okay? 
Those are the two kinds. Now, in here, I got some little activity things for you, right? So hopefully you're all close enough to one of those, right? So everybody's got one nearby them. So I'm, let me show you what you have here. The first thing you have is a little bottle of diluted acid, okay? Um, so be a little bit careful with this. You just don't want to get it on your hands. If you get it on your hands, it won't hurt. It won't like hurt you. But I think the only thing you want to avoid is make sure if you do get it on your hands, just wash them off, you know? And uh, avoid getting it on your hands because the danger is to be if you rub your eyes after you get it on your hands, right? So you don't want to do that. So um, you should probably just go wash your hands, you know, after you use this. And, um, but it's, it's, I mean, it's not like, it's the very negative should be perfectly safe. Um, now, so there's some acid here. And then you have an oyster shell. Okay? And you also have some little mineral grains here. You see these mineral grains? Okay, that mineral, Colton, do you know what mineral that is? Sorry, I'm testing him because he's a geology major. What's that? What? Which one? Uh, this one right here. You can't see it. It's the stuff that isn't sand. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. Okay, it's, it's calcite. calcite. So it's calcium carbonate. Okay, so the mineral that you have there is calcite, which is made of calcium carbonate. Okay? So what you also have is you also have there some biogenous sediment, right? So can you all see that biogenous sediment you have there? It's made out of kind of broken clam shells and broken oyster shells and things like that. Okay, so what I want you to do is take your little acid dropper, and you don't need a lot of acid, but just put a little bit on each thing and see what happens. What are you observing? What's that? Yeah, go ahead and do it in the box. So what are, what are people observing? What's that? Yeah, it's okay to yeah, do it. Yeah. Right? Do you, do you all see everything fizzing? Okay, so, so what is happening, do you think? You see it fizzing. Exactly. So the calcium carbonate is being eaten up by the acid. Did anybody put some acid on the oyster shell? Try putting some on the oyster shell and see what happens. So you see it? You all see it fizzing? You can actually hear it if you require. Yeah, I think so. Sounds like a snap, crackle, and pop. Okay. So what you're seeing is the acid, so the acid is actually just hydrogen ion, it's just, it's just a hydrogen atom that is minus one electron, so it's looking for a partner. That's what makes it so caustic, right? It's kind of, it's missing an electron and it's looking to fill up that electron, so it's very caustic. So that's what makes acid so reactive. So you have a hydrogen ion, which is the acid. And it's reacting with the carbonate, the part of the calcium. It's reacting with the carbonate, and it's forming CO2 gas. So what you see being kind of, do you, do you all see how there's kind of like gases escaping from that, the bubbling? What is escaping? It's the CO2 gas. And then the CO2 gas, and then it's also forming, to balance the equation, it's also just forming water. Okay. So what is happening? You're, you're seeing that calcium carbonate breaks down with acid, okay? Well, what do many marine organisms make their shells out of? Calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, right? They make it out of calcite. This, this mineral that you have right here is calcium carbonate calcite, okay? So all of these marine organisms, including the plankton, so from the big stuff to the small stuff, making their shells out of calcium carbonate. Okay, so remember that as we go forward, because it's going to become 
very important. But the main thing I want you to remember is that these organisms make their shells out of calcium carbonate and it breaks down with the acid. Okay, so it's very reactive with acid. Okay, so here's another, here's another uh, map. It's a pretty important map. And this is showing you the thickness of various sediments. Showing you the thickness of various sediments over the oceans. So where is the sediment thickest, generally speaking? Neritic or pelagic environments? Neritic, right? And that maybe makes sense because there's a, you can think of all the rivers of the world bringing in a lot of sediment washed off the continents. Okay. So it's neritic. How thick are some of those sediments? Do you, can you see the bar, the scale bar there? Up to 10 kilometers. Is that amazing? I mean, you're talking about like eight miles of sediment all the way down. That's a lot of sediment, right? What do you think the sediment, how, how about the Gulf of Mexico? Do we have a lot of sediment or do we have kind of a little bit in the Gulf of Mexico? Y'all see the Gulf? It's a lot. That's a lot, right? I mean, it's like crazy a lot. There's not too many other places, right? That, so we're in the Gulf right here. So we're talking about the coast of Texas, right? It's like crazy a lot. It's like, it's like the maximum amount, right? So like 10 kilometers, okay? The only other place where you get as much is maybe like there off the coast. That's, that's in the Bay of Bengal. That's the Ganges, where the Ganges River comes out of India. There you get a lot too. Um, you can see where all the major rivers of the world, like the Amazon, there's a buildup of sediment. Okay, so something to think about. Where in the, now you see pelagic environments are generally very, much thinner. See, then you're, there you're only talking up to maybe two kilometers. You see that? It's such a big difference that we needed to have two scale bars. You all see that? We kind of have a scale bar that's for neuritic, and we have another one that's for pelagic, because there's such a big difference. Now, some places have maybe up to two kilometers of sediment in the pelagic environments, uh, but a lot of those places are, look at, there's these big areas that have nothing. Now, does anybody, I want you to take a look. Do you see where the black areas are? Does anybody kind of recognize what's at those black areas? Look right here in the middle of the Atlantic. And, the, and right here, what's that? Does anybody remember what's right there? Yeah, the volcanoes, which are the, the mid-Atlantic mid ridge. Right here is the East Pacific rise. So these are ridges. And guess what? The ridges, that's newborn baby crust, right? So it hasn't had time to build up sediment. So that's why there's not much sediment there. The parts of the pelagic environments that have a lot of sediment it's old crust, and it's had maybe 180 million years to build up the sediment on top of it. Does that all make sense to, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, um, notice there's also, can anybody explain this? Do you notice this kind of belt of heavier sediment that's kind of right around the equator? Does everybody see that? Does anybody have a hypothesis about why that might be there? Why there's a kind of a belt of sediment, like heavy sediment around the equator? Because of the Sahara. That's a very good guess, because of the Sahara. Of course, the Sahara is right here. So, um, it, but that's a very, very good guess. But it's not, it's not quite that. Any other ideas? So because it's warm. It's warm, and what does warm mean? If it's warm water, what is warm going to do? Think, think about the life. Think about the biogenous sediments. Any ideas? Yeah, there's a lot of sea life. Okay, there's a lot of planktonic life and microbial life. So what's going on right here is that it's hot. And because it's hot, there's a lot of life. And because there's a lot of life, it's generating a lot of sediment, biogenous sediment. Okay? So does that make sense? Everybody follow me there? So some things to think about. OK, so um, what sort of sediment dominates in the pelagic environments and versus the neuritic environments? So what kind of sediment dominates in the neuritic environments? 
to originus set up. Very good. Yeah, you might just want to. Everybody could just practice saying that because it's kind of a mouthful. You have to put the accent in the right place. And then what kind of sediment dominates in pelagic environments, generally speaking? Yeah, you could put abyssal clays or biogenous, um, like calcareous ooze or silica ooze, either one of those. Okay, now a lot of neritic sediments are brought to, you know, they're brought off of the continents, right? And then they go, they go surging down the um, continental slopes. What are you trying to freeze through, like squint? Right, my glasses broke. Oh, their glasses broke. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> it says the thickest sediment buildup is at the mouths of major rivers, like the Amazon and the Mississippi and the Ganges. So does everybody see this cloud of rushing sediment going down a slope? That is kind of a model of turbidity currents. Okay, so turbidity currents are, do you all remember we talked about submarine can canyons and continental slopes and stuff like that? Do you all recall that? Okay, so turbidity currents, and do you all remember when I showed you the video of the submarine and it's down there doing whatever submarines do down there, and then it gets, it gets enveloped by like the cloud of, of dust or cloud of mud, right? So that's a turbidity current. So what happens is that all this stuff gets brought in by rivers uh, into the continental shelves. And then little by what happens once in a while is those shelves collapse and you get these rushing of, rushing of uh, huge, what are called submarine slides. They're like submarine landslides in a way of, um, all this mishmash of sediments of dust and clays and, and uh, sand and gravel and everything. And it goes rushing down the side. And that, those things are called turbidity currents. And they accumulate in these graded sediments that are known as submarine fans. OK? So this is maybe what you should draw here for number for number eight. So you have these submarine canyons that are incised and cutting into the shelf, right? And then at the base of those, you have these turbidity currents that will rush down and form these deep sea turbidity, or what are called submarine fans. Is anybody confused? No, we're done. Okay. Oops. Yeah, so what is a turbidite? So turbidite are actually the, it's actually um, the rock or the sediment deposit that's formed from turbidity currents. See that turbidite deposit is formed from the turbidity. Y'all got that? Are we good now? Okay, go on. All right, now number 10 is saying, what's the typical range of sediment thickness in near shore environments on uh, continental shelves? So remember, we already looked at that map, right? So you're talking about anywhere from, looks like, well, I mean, it could be anywhere from like two to 10 kilometers, right? So it's a lot of, it's a lot of sediment. A lot of sediment builds up.
Now, if you compare that, of course, to the abyssal plains, it's much different. You're only talking about like hundreds of meters to maybe up to maximum two kilometers. Okay. So the, again, the abyssal plains generally have a lot less sediment on them, generally speaking. Um, another thing I should point out here, you might notice that sediment thickness is generally greater on the Atlantic than the, than the Pacific. You can see that there's some parts of the Pacific that are like totally barren. So a big reason for this is that it just so happens that a lot of the rivers of the world, the biggest rivers of the world, drain into the Atlantic and not to the Pacific. So that's part of the reason. Okay, and now, um, so is everybody caught up to like number 12 now? Did we all catch up there? Okay, so number 12 says what, the calcareous ooze, what is the calcareous ooze made out of? Calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate, right? And so copy down that formula, you want that chemical formula, which is calcium carbonate, right? This one. Now, what is the source of that calcium carbonate? Where's that calcium carbonate coming from in calcareous ooze? What's making it? Planktonic yeah. Life. The marine life, the planktonic life. I mean, even just, you could just say the marine life, right? Okay, so remember this. The acid, this is going to become very important. The acid eats away the calcium carbonate, right? Eats away the calcium carbonate. Okay, there's the turbidity currents, those are neuritic environments. Rated bedding, okay, talked about this. Another reason that the Pacific is, generally has less sediment Look at the age of the, um, kind of the average age of the Atlantic. This is a map showing ages. Do you notice how a lot more of the Pacific is covered with red? Notice that the red is very young. Whereas the average age of the Pacific is, uh, you know, probably on average the, the Atlantic, sorry, Atlantic. Generally speaking, probably the Atlantic is kind of older than the Pacific. So that's another reason that it has more sediment built up there, generally speaking. So there's pelagic sediments on the deep ocean floor. Okay, neuritic, pelagic, so we already talked about this. There's your calcareous ooze. So what's the calcareous ooze made out of? We have the calcium carbonate shells and tests of these, like that's a coccolithophore right there. There's foraminifera, there's pteropods, there's all sorts of things that are planktonic and they compose that ooze. We call it ooze. And you might think ooze sounds really gross, but guess what? Does anybody like opal? Does anybody like the gemstone opal? Yeah, yeah you're kind of, it's okay. Well, it's pretty, right? Yeah, but guess what? Opal is just made from that, that silica ooze. And it's just hardened sil silica ooze. So it can, it can, when it hardens and lithifies, it does form very beautiful things, although ooze doesn't sound very attractive. Yeah. There you go. So here's just some nice pictures of calcareous ooze. This is from a drill core from the bottom of the, of the uh, sediment of the ocean. And it's just this white. It's made out of all these little coccolithophores and things like that. Okay? And if you want to actually see some real ones, that's why I brought the microscope to look at some real, real things like that. All right, now, remember, this stuff is calcium carbonate and it reacts with the acid. Now, we gotta, we gotta start talking about acid in the ocean water. Acid in the ocean water. 
So that means I'm going to talk about acid in the ocean water. I've got to bring a carbonated beverage. So this is, this is um, just totally unsweetened HEB sparkling water. Okay? Uh, yeah, sure. A little fanfare. But um, sparkling water, there's, so there's nothing in it. It's just totally plain, 100% plain. It's just carbonated, plain carbonated water. Okay? Now, um, what I have here is this is a pH indicator, okay? If it's, if it's um, green, it means, and maybe you can kind of see this, those of you who are close by, you can see it's kind of green right now. Green means it's just kind of neutral. If it's blue, it's kind of a little bit more on the basic side. And then if it turns yellow, it means it's acidic, okay? So I'm gonna get some Corpus Christi tap water here. What color do you think it'll turn? Let's see what color the water is without any in it. Oh, it's clear. That's good. Well, it's kind of gray. That's just from the bubble center. Okay, so here's Corpus Christi tap water. Okay, so so neutral, the, so if it's kind of greenish, darkish green, it should be neutral, pH neutral. If it is uh, alkali or alkaline, that means it's got to have a higher pH. But you know what? And it'll turn blue. But you know what? A lot of people like a little, like, have you ever gone to the store and see they have alkaline water? It's like pH 10 or something. Or so a lot of people like kind of alkaline water. So I will, I will bet, hopefully, this water is kind of blue, okay, when I put the pH indicator. Okay, that's what we hope. Because they usually make the water kind of with a little bit higher pH to make it more palatable. So I'm going to put it in, and we'll see what happens. I hope it Oh, oh yeah, it turned nice and blue. You all see that? It turned nice and blue. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. So that's, that's what it should do. Okay? So that's just normal water. And it's, it's you know, because they put they probably put a little bit of mineral content in it to make it more blue. Now here is some um, here's some baking soda. Does anybody know what baking soda is made of? Happen to know? It's um, it's, it's actually, it's a carbonate. It's a carbonate, it's sodium carbonate, okay? So I'm gonna put a little, I'm gonna put a little bit of this and just see what happens. Stir it up and see what goes on. It's gonna take a little while for it to dissolve. But we'll leave that there. Okay, now, let's do something else. Now, here I have some HEB soda. Okay. So what do you think? Is, do you think there's going to be blue? What do you think? What, do you, what color do you think it's going to be? Do you think it's going to be green or yellow? yellow? Do you think it's going to be yellow? Okay. Why do you think it's going to be yellow? Do you think it's going to be? But they don't put any lemon in it or anything. It's just plain. They don't put any lemon juice. Okay. We'll see. So I'm going to pull. So you see all the bubbles coming out, right? So that what are all that bubbles coming out? Carbon what? So what's all the bubbles coming out? Car carbon dioxide. <laughs> yes, carbon dioxide. So this is absolutely full of carbon dioxide, right? It's loaded with carbon dioxide. What's that? Yeah, and you see how it's fizzing, just like you put the acid on these and it's fizzing, right? It's releasing CO2. So I'm gonna put some in here. Whoa. So it's very different, right? So it's got a it's got a it's got a much lower pH. So it's actually acid. So that's why you, did your mom ever tell you like stop drinking so much soda and you're gonna ruin your teeth? So she was right, you know, because it does because it's acid. I mean you can see even the plain, even the plain soda is acid. Why is it acid? And does, has anyone ever drank this and just kind of noticed like it just kind of tastes a little sour? Yeah. Yeah, even though it's absolutely plain, it, there's no flavoring in it. It tastes sour because of it is acid. So like I remember when I first tried this when I was a kid and I was like, no, they gotta put lemon juice in it or lime juice in it or something. But it's not true. It's really just super it's really just that acidic. And I mean you can see how acidic it is and how different it is, right? Okay, so you can see the difference then, right? See the difference. So what can we say? A lot of CO2 dissolved in the water, so a lot of CO2 dissolved in the water creates acid, right? 
what breaks down with a lot of acid from the experiments you just did? The calcium carbonate, right? So think about this. There's, there's acid in the water. It can react with the carbonate and break down the shells and all the little tests and things like that that are, dissolved, that are in the water. It can actually dissolve them away. So does that all make sense? Okay, so this is a very important principle we've just explored right here. CO2 dissolves into the water. It creates an acid called carbonic acid. The carbonic acid can then react with the calcium carbonate in the calcareous oozes and other things and break it down and dissolve it. All right, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm, I know there's a lot of stuff that is not, I'm telling you right now, that is not on your lecture assignment, but it's all to like prepare you to understand the next part because it's very, the next part's very complicated, okay? Because it's on the CCD, it's a part calcite uh, compensation depth. It's very hard to understand, so that's why I'm trying to prep you for it here. All right, so <clears throat> CO2 from the atmosphere dissolves into the water. It makes the water acidic. That acidic water can then react with the calcium carbonate and, and break down the calcite, break down the shells, break down the tests, and all that other stuff. Now, here's another thing. Think about this. If I have a can of soda like this, and let's say it's closed, okay, I haven't opened it yet. Pretend I haven't opened it yet. Can you hear the bubbles coming out of it? Are the bubbles coming out of it when, when, it's, when it's closed? Why do the bubbles come out of it? Why does the CO2 come out of it when I open it up? Yeah, I released the pressure. I released the pressure. So think about this. Is there a part of the ocean that has a lot of pressure? Deep in the ocean, right? So do you think deep in the ocean you're gonna have more CO2 dissolved? Yeah, because it's just like your can of soda under pressure, right? The CO2 can't come out, so it's dissolved in there and it makes it carbonic acid, it makes it very acidic. If you ever had any doubts about high pressure in the, uh, in the water, Take a look at this. This is my coffee cup. That's no, not my coffee cup. But that's a little start. Can you all see that? You know what that is? It's not a thimble. This is a styrofoam cup that they took back, took down on the Alvin um, submersible vessel off the coast of California. And it's tiny now. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll pass that around. So this is how it started off. And now pass it around and take a look at how it looks now. So it's high pressure, right? High pressure. So that high pressure helps the CO2 dissolve into the water, makes the pH go down, makes acid, the acid reacts with the carbon, with the carbonate, eats it away and dissolves it. All right, now we got all that straight in your mind. We got to talk about the calcium, or sorry, the calcite compensation depth, CCD. The calcite compensation depth. All right, if you go down, down, down to the ocean floor, you will find that there are little there are parts of the ocean that almost look as if they have snow on top of them. Almost like, almost like you go to the mountains, you see that there's kind of a line, like a snow line in the mountains. Has anyone ever seen that before? Know what I'm talking about? There's like a snow line in the mountains and above which there's snow and below which there's no snow. You'll see something that almost looks like marine snow. What is that marine snow? That marine snow is calcareous ooze. It's that calcium carbonate ooze. The thing that happens is that once you get below a certain point, the um, pressure is so great, 
the pressure is so great that there's so much carbonic acid dissolved into the ocean water that it dissolves away any calcium carbonate. So calcium carbonate cannot build up below the CCD. Calcium carbonate cannot build up below the CCD. So that creates this effect that almost looks like marine snow that's on top of sea mounts and ridges and other things like that. Below the CCD, the calcite compensation depth, there's so much carbonic acid in the water that it's because of the pressure that calcite cannot, calcium carbonate cannot accumulate. Does that make sense to everybody now? So you see why I had to do all these demonstrations, because otherwise you, it would be a really weird idea. What's that? What can't accumulate? Calcium carbonate can't accumulate. More specifically, calcite can't accumulate. So in the photic zone, in the photic zone where there's a lot of sunlight, plankton is doing its photosynthesis, is producing the shells, the calcium carbonate shells. Those, those organisms die, their bodies, their bodies sink. Now in relatively shallow areas, you can accumulate the calcium carbonate. You see that? But if you get too, too deep, you hit the CCD, and now calcium carbonate ooze cannot accumulate below the CCD line. Do you all follow? Does this all make sense? Good? Okay, so can you all answer number 14? What is the CCD and why does it exist? What causes the CCD? Can, it, can anybody make so bold as to answer that? What causes the CCD? Pressure. Sure, the pressure, could you elaborate a little bit more? So it kind of begins with pressure. So the pressure causes what? It causes it to dissolve more into the water, which causes it to become more acidic. And then that, and that in turn, dissolves away the carbonate shells. Oh, okay, so as they're going down, eventually they just... Yeah, they hit the, yeah, they go down and they hit the CCD and then they start to dissolve. And it's not like they hit the CDC, the CCD and they just go, and they disappear. They, they just start to dissolve. And then eventually they will dissolve. And that's why there's no buildup. And that's why there's no buildup. So you see where the calcium carbonate is building up? It's the, the sediment, the biogenous sediment is building up in a relatively shallow area. So this is actually a, um, this is a very important diagram. You're going to see this diagram a lot in this class. But it's showing depth, and it's showing the concentration of oxygen and the concentration of CO2. So what happens to CO2 as you go down deeper into the ocean? It gets more concentrated. It gets more concentrated, right? There's especially, there's a, there's a, there's a place right from maybe about like 500 meters to maybe a thousand meters deep, where it really picks up a lot. Okay. Now, notice what happens. There's kind of like the almost the total opposite, like a mirror image opposite happens with oxygen. Oxygen is very high, and then it plummets. Okay, and it, it increases marginally only because oxygen again can dissolve better into into um, higher pressure water. But can anybody explain this? Why does oxygen start off high near the surface and then it plummets? And at the same time, CO2 does the opposite. It starts off low and increases. So why, does, why is CO2 low near the surface, but, but oxygen is high near the surface? Any ideas? Can you think of any hypotheses that might explain that? What's that? Density? Density, yeah, that's a good guess. Well, I'll give you a hint, it has to do with life. So think, of, think in terms of life, a biologic cause. So what could be causing high oxygen levels in the surface water? 
Yeah, the algae, right? Remember, there's, this is filled with photosynthetic algae, photosynthetic life in the photic zone. Okay, so there's a lot of photosynthesis. Remember, photosynthesis pumps up the oxygen and it sucks up the carbon dioxide, right? That's what plants do and, and photosynthetic organisms do. They take CO2 out. So that's why CO2 starts off low, oxygen starts off high. But why does that plummet when you get down deep, like below 500 meters? You lose sunlight. You lose sunlight. So that's what's going on here. You lose the sunlight, the photosynthesis is no longer happening, and CO2 increases and oxygen decreases. And, and But you know, the, even though photosynthesis isn't happening, there's a lot of animals that live down there that use oxygen and give off CO2. So that's why that also exacerbates the whole situation. Okay. All right, so we took care of number 13, number 14. Let's talk about salacious ooze. So salacious ooze is, remember, that's made out of silica. So it's very analogous to calcareous ooze, but it's made out of silica instead of carbonate. So um, again, if you look, you zoom in on like diatoms and radiolarians, there's a lot of shells, a lot of organisms that make their shells out of silica. Now, silica in the ocean is, it is a hot item. It's a really hot item. Everybody wants it. And it's actually very, very depleted in the ocean water, dissolved in the ocean water. Everyone wants it. So um, these are all types of diatoms and radiolarians that make their shells out of silica. And that silica is going to build up just like the calcareous ooze is going to build up. Now, this is a thing I want you to consider here. Silica is not affected by acid. Silica is not affected by acid. The acid doesn't, doesn't eat it away, like the calcareous ooze. However, however, now this is the answer to, um, this is the answer kind of number six, uh, let's see. Why is carbonate ooze and silica ooze generated near surface? So I already answered number 16, right? We answered that. We answered number 15. Everybody got number 15, right? There are three parts to that question, so make sure you hit every part. 17, why does silica ooze only accumulate in areas with high productivity? Now, I'm going to answer that right now, okay? Is everybody ready? Why does silica only accumulate in places with high productivity? That means high, a lot of photosynthesis, okay? Remember, remember how I showed you there's a lot of this buildup around the equator? Okay, so there's a lot of buildup because that's a high productivity area because it's very warm year round, very warm. Okay, so silica tests are sinking, the little silica shells are sinking, they're building up here. But in places with low productivity, they don't accumulate. The reason that they don't accumulate, oh, I don't have that, sorry. Whoops. Oh gosh, I screwed this up. I thought I had a a slide showing this a little bit better. So the reason this doesn't accumulate is because uh, silica dissolves, naturally dissolves in the water. So silica naturally will dissolve in the water, especially high pressure waters. But if there's so much silica, the water will become saturated with it and, and then it can accumulate. But in places with not much silica, it dissolves into the water, okay? An, an, an analogous situation would be this. Did you all see how I poured some, I poured some baking soda into it, right? I, into, this, into this beaker? Where is the baking soda now? Is it, is it on the bottom? You all see it's on, is it on the bottom? It didn't accumulate. Why didn't it accumulate? It dissolved, right? What if I kept adding a lot more? I just kept pouring it in. It added a lot. Would it start to accumulate eventually? Yeah, it would start to accumulate because at a certain point, the water is just going to become totally saturated with it and it can't hold anymore. It can't dissolve anymore. So at, at a certain point, the water becomes saturated with silica and then, um, and then it can start to accumulate. So that's why you only get buildup in places with high productivity. Does that make sense? Everybody? 
So is everybody able to answer number, what is it, number 17? Okay, so number 17 is because the water becomes, in high permittivity areas, the water becomes saturated with silica. It can no longer dissolve away the silica shells, the silica tests and shells. Okay, this is a really good slide. Um, I'm not going to really talk about it at, at all too much, um, but I, I just want you to like, it, this would be a really good slide to just go back and look at and contemplate, because it, it's really just a very good summary of the different kind, a lot, like almost everything that we've talked about, like terrigenous sediments and turbidity currents and abyssal clays, manganese nodules and silica ooze and calcareous ooze and blah, 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 blah. It's all there. So um, it's a really good kind of summary slide that is, I would, I would just recommend for study when you're preparing for the next midterm. Okay. okay, now where are we? There's just like one more, one more question, right? Um, okay, one thing I want to point out to you that's kind of interesting is that, you know there are marine sedimentary rocks on top of Mount Everest. Isn't that weird? So how did those get up there? Well, those got up there because, you know, after sediments are lithified, they turn into rock, okay? And the rocks of the Grand Canyon, similarly, are all made out of marine sediments. So how did those get there? They're all made out of marine sediments. They're all made out of like limestone and calcareous oozes and siliceous oozes and things like that. So how did they get there? How did the sediments get way up there on the top of Mount Everest? <laughs> so it's because um, the thing is that sea levels have changed over Earth's history. Okay. So sometimes they have been much lower, sometimes they've been much higher. There have been times in Earth's history that will shock you where America was almost totally covered with water. Right? So that was during the age of the dinosaurs. A lot of the interior of America was totally covered with totally covered with water. It's actually been worse than that. There are parts of the Paleozoic where everything's totally covered, totally covered with water, just the Appalachian Mountains poking out. So, it's, it's, so that's how we get, you know, um, those marine sediments and sedimentary rocks building up on, in mountain peaks. Right? So anyway, I just kind of want to let you know about that. Changing sea levels is a very common thing throughout, throughout uh, Earth history. Okay, so that's all I have for you today. Thank you for your attention, and I will see you on, what is it, uh, Monday. Please leave your assignment number 10. And do I have anything else to say? Is there anything else that needs to be said? No, I don't think there's any other announcements. So have fun, and I'll see you next time. Oh, if you want to look at the microscope, I have the microscope up here. If you haven't gotten a chance to look at any of the radiolarium, well, I don't have radiolarium, but I have foraminiferum. And I have some diatoms. See that there are actually a group of uh, some foraminifera in there. Hi. Yeah. And then uh, so you can take a look at Olson. So 
is with 4 amps. Yeah. And then, let me see if these are very different. Well, this one's actually better. This one's more clear. There's some different kinds of 4 amps there. Same thing. Uh, they're just different sorts. So. That's kind of actually a better slide. Now those are silica, those are uh, carbonate based. These ones are silica based. These are silica ooze types. These are radiolarians. Now this you have to look kind of closer. I'm actually thinking I should turn this. I wonder if I should, you can barely see this. You know what actually would be better is to look at this with a petrographic microscope. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah. Because it because it would because you can barely see this. I should bring the petrographic microscope though. This one's not as cool because you can't you can barely see them. Because the thing's crazy. Yeah. The things you can see in them. Yeah. And like the color alterations are everything. Yeah. Uh -huh. it's crazy. yeah. See these would refract the light so that you would it would be picked up with those color alterations that yeah, you're talking about. You just see like an outline. Yeah, you can just yeah. see that one. Yeah. But anyway, um, so those are just to give you some idea about the kind of creatures that the kind of creatures that the fish can see. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so that's all I have to do. I can't read, but I didn't know this was cross Yeah, oh I've so seen, seen some so sorry, I was like, picking on you. No, I've seen it in veins, but I haven't. Oh yeah. Oh, cause yeah. you took you took uh, online labs, huh? Yeah. Oh yeah. I see. It's such a disadvantage. Yeah. It's too bad. It is. But right, you'll catch up. <laughs> yeah. Catch up. Yeah. All right. We get a good one. Yeah. Yeah. You have a good one.